and the mama bear in me just, I just wanted to go over there. And, and you can do one of two things. And of course, our minds went to the worst case scenario. Devastating would be the word that I would use to describe it. You can crush them or you can lift them up. I would say have hope. Oh, he, he actually likes us, honey. We're better for him when we take care of ourselves. I'm not, I, I don't, I don't like them. I'm just exploiting them. <laughs> Welcome to Cakes and Conversations. Today I'm excited to introduce you to Greg and Karen Davis. They're the parents of Riley Davis, who was the guest on our show last week. Riley's a 15 year old young man who's incredibly talented, loves his YouTube channel, and is also visually impaired. If you missed his show, go ahead and click the card above and watch it now. But today we get to see something special. We get to hear what it's like to raise a child with a disability, with a visual impairment, from a parent's perspective. Well, be sure to subscribe because when you subscribe, you help us change how people experience disability one creation at a time. And as you know, we believe every creation is beautiful and everyone deserves to be treated like royalty. So let's start treating. We'll see you in the kitchen. So this is my mom and this is my dad. And these are my arms that are trapped. <laughs> my mom is uh, works at Crossroads Church in the communications section. So she doesn't, and she doesn't have a lot of experience in front of the camera. My dad does a very confusing job at Superior Essex, which is a company that makes magnet wire. And he has to drive to Atlanta every Thursday morning. What words would you think your parents would use to describe you? Spoiled, a brat, and also nice at sometimes. <laughs> Hey, I'm being honest. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> what words would you use to describe Riley? <laughs> um, sarcastic, um, very smart, um, a little bit sneaky. Yeah, Dad? He can be, he's very smart, uh, overcomes a lot. Um, he's, he's amazing, he surprises me in a lot of things he can do that I would never thought he could do. Um, but he's also pretty stubborn sometimes. What's your favorite thing about your parents? They are uh, good believers in God. Yeah. Will y'all tell me how you felt when you found out um, early on that Riley was visually impaired? What was that like, kind of that experience for you? Um, well, he was, I won't go into all the details, but he was like four weeks old. So we were, he was our second, our first child is typical. Um, so very normal, healthy pregnancy, um, actually for both of them. Um, so he had a high fever when he was about four weeks old. So newborn and we had gone in for a checkup. Um, and the pediatrician called in another pediatrician into the room and they turned out the lights and they were shining lights in his eyes and stuff so it was all very confusing because they weren't really telling us what they were thinking and then they sent us to a specialist which was even more confusing um, but I mean I remember when they told us that he was gonna have to have eye surgery um, and that was when he was eight weeks he had his first one um, I mean we were still reeling from a second baby which was a lot um, so it was just very overwhelming and of course our minds went to the worst case scenario and um, we started reading stuff and just you know you have people who um, were naysayers that he's never gonna do anything and this will be life-changing and you know he'll have all kinds of needs um, so it was it, devastating would be the word that I would use to describe it. Um, so there were there were a few dark days there for sure. So well, I don't cry very often, but I remember when we were sitting in the doctor's office and he uh, took the eye uh, model he had and he opened it up and he showed us what he was going to do to our little baby. And uh, I lost it. And then he said another thing to us. He said, um, just consider this to be like a mountain climb. And he said, what we're about to do is the fails. And 
we really didn't have any idea what he was talking about. He knew the possibilities and he knew what could happen. You know, so we got into our normal life and there were some things that were kind of tough when he had the cataracts. But when, um, when we found out he had glaucoma and then uh, when, he, um, when he lost his vision and his left. Um, we we were very blessed. Like looking back, um, I mean, I, I I see the hand of God in all of this. And and our now we haven't seen the end of the story because um, one of my prayers is has always kind of it started me and God showed me the big picture because we would get so lost in the details that I I couldn't see the good sometimes. And so I would just beg for God to show us the end game, the big picture of what this meant. He was behind developmentally um, because we learned so much by sight that he, um, and because he couldn't see anything and like babies learn by repeating what they see in their parents' faces and stuff and he couldn't see us when he was born because of the cataracts. And so then once he had the surgeries and we started, he had contacts actually as a baby, which now if I can't think I can't do something, I think about putting contacts in a baby and if I'm like if I could do that I could do this but um so we had a he had a physical therapist who started working with him and she said you have two paths and she was she was phenomenal and she said you can normally with vision kids you can shield them from everything or you can let them experience everything but there's going to be a lot of hardship and there's going to be a lot of scraped knees and there's going to be a lot of like fear and you're just going to have to shut your mouth and let it happen and so we during that time I don't remember like an exact point but we decided we wanted to let him experience everything and she said with vision kids you want them to touch to feel to smell to experience everything because they're not taking it in visually and so I remember watching him on the playground when he was just toddling around and he would get to the end of these shaky bridges and stuff and I would literally put my hand over my mouth to not say watch out for the end and he would just go right off the end but then you know a couple of times later he wouldn't go off the end because he learned where the end was and we would let him climb up things and everything and I would literally just sit there like you know don't say anything don't say anything and it sounds like a terrible parenting thing to do but I'm so glad that she told us that because he loves roller coasters he loves and he will touch things and not be afraid and he used to run just straight ahead he knows how to ride a bike he used to ride it straight into the bushes but we let him ride the bike and you know it's stuff like that that I'm I'm glad that we let him experience because I and that's, it's not patting us on the back. And again, God put that lady in our path. Um, but I feel like we embraced that and we just said, if his brother's gonna do it, he's gonna do it. And he's not gonna, there's no excuses. That you, <laughs> no, okay. I was just, no, I was just Sorry. about to burp. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you're not gonna like, throw up on me or anything, are you? I'm sorry, <laughs> he is a teenage boy. I mean, you never know. <laughs> hey, I gotta be honest. What are some things like with, you know, a kid like Riley that you would say, hey, we really wish that people would. Teach them that everybody's important, you know, um, just because they're, just because something's different about them, doesn't mean that they're not a person. They're a person just as much as anybody else's person. And they have feelings. And if you can, you can do one of two things. You can crush them or you can lift them up. And if you can lift them up, and, I, and I'll give a good example of lifting up. One of the things Karen said, we always let Riley do things. And so we were able to put him in some, some sports opportunities. Uh, he loves football, so he can't play tackle, but he's able to play flag football. And I remember this one time when Riley, right at the end of the season, he broke one and took it all the way to the goal line, touchdown. There was cheer, both sides, parents. And um, they were familiar with what Riley was struggling with. And so when he did that, um, it was applauded on both sides, parents cheering as he went downfield. 
and when he crossed both teams. So those are kids who absorb the energy of their parents, what their parents were teaching them. In our house, I mean, we're, we're religious and not everybody is gonna be that way. So we teach our kids that people are created in God's image. We also teach them that God doesn't make mistakes. And which has been hard for us in talking to Riley sometimes through the years because he knows that God has a plan for his life. He knows that God knew that he was gonna be born with vision loss and the struggles that he's had. That was not a mistake because God doesn't make mistakes and God will use it and he'll use it for good. But even for people who don't have faith to lean into, I would say, um, you know, it's just include the kids. There were so many times when he was smaller that he would get invited to those class parties. And there were some great moms who were like, what can we do? You know, we're gonna have a bounce house. What would you recommend that we do? But ask those questions. Say, we want your child to come. I, I just want your child to be safe. What can I do? What can I, you know, and, and if it's a different type of goodie bag, if it's a, even like, you know, with him, um, you know, our thing with like kids camps and stuff, when at church and stuff, it was always like, if they're in a big dark room, just make sure that somebody is with him and he doesn't get lost. And so just have, so even at parties and stuff, if you're gonna go do laser tag or something like that, just have an adult keep an eye on him to make sure that when the group leaves the room, he's not still standing in the room. So it's, ask the parents. It's so much better than not inviting because you're afraid that he's gonna get hurt or, or you won't know how to include him. So just ask the questions. He doesn't read body language, which can be a gift because people's facial expressions, their eye rolling, their sneering, whatever, you can tell what people are thinking if they don't say it. But if you leave that and you don't have that, you tend to think better of people. And I remember going to a field day when he was in elementary school and these kids were like going around him and they were backing up far enough to where he couldn't see them. Like he was calling for them and it was almost like they were playing a little game behind him and they would skirt and he was walking around looking for them but it was like they knew that if they stayed just far enough away, they wouldn't see him and they were laughing and they were moving. And of course I was standing over there watching them and the mama bear in me just, I just wanted to go over there and, you know, just let them have it. But I didn't, because I didn't want to get thrown off the school property and arrested. But anyway, <laughs> um, but in the car on the way home, I asked him, I said, you know, tell me about this, these kids. And I was just asking him about it. He was like, what about them? And I'm like, you know, tell me about them. And he's like, oh, mom, they're my really good friends. They're so nice. And at first I was kind of like, well, that just burns me up. He feels that way. But then later, as I started thinking about it, I thought, you know, that's he sees the good because he can't see that outside ugly that sometimes we see. And so I, I think that that is, um, it's just perspective. And I think it's perspective for people who are typical and who aren't. And if you honor people and you see them as worth, as worthy, as, you know, we all deserve to at least have the space to be here and ask questions, ask those questions. He's not invisible. He is there. Kids in wheelchairs, they're not invisible. Kids, so just ask. And I'd rather somebody ask a question and say, hmm, that's a little personal, than to just act like we don't even exist. You know, several years ago, there was a small child that walked up to him and like, why are your glasses so big? And that was okay because kids are honest and everything. And so I was able to say, well, he needs them to see. And you know, his. That's, it's like a tool that he uses to be able to see. And the kid was like, okay, and just kind of walked off. You know, the, the best thing I would say with like people with visual impairments would be to introduce yourself when you come up. Like to say, um, hey, you know, it's Karen, and I'd like to shake your hand. And then you extend your hand. So you can't, like again, it's that body language. Like we, some of the, he has some people at church and some different places who will walk by him in the hall and say, hey, it's Mr. Greg, how are you doing, Riley? And so, because if you just said, hey, how you doing? He's not gonna know who you are. 
And so just even introducing yourself, just coming up to somebody and say, saying, you know, your name, hi, Riley, my name is, um, you know, and I, I want to shake your hand or, uh, hey, may I help you through the store? Or, hey, I just wanted to point out, um, you know, that your book bag is unzipped and your books might fall out. So to, I, I mean, that just to verbally announce things that he might not catch um, is even a way to kind of get to know him. Well, I've got an embarrassing oh. thought. Oh gosh. When I was getting my black belt um, in front of the Grand Master himself, <laughs> I bowed and shook his hand and started down the line of like all his bodyguard dudes. No, um, it wasn't his bodyguards. It was the other instructors, silly. Oh, they looked like bodyguards, though. <laughs> they did. They were, they were standing mm. very straight. <laughs> they were wearing tuxedos, and the man was wearing like a, you know, you mean after you ran past him? Yeah. So, yeah. so like, because you didn't know where to stop. Yeah. Because no, yeah. yeah, like, because like he he was holding out the black belt, and in front of everybody, I just moved on past. And then the next guy was like, "Go get your black belt." I was like, "What?" <laughs> yeah, they they should have probably helped you with that a little bit. <laughs> and the guy was, I, I look over, and the guy's just standing there facing the crowd, holding the black belt out, just like this. And he he was some really important dude too. So. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of your hopes for him? Uh, well, you know, I hope he's able to go on and uh, go to college and, and find a career. Um, he would really love to be participating as a, uh, a football coach. And we've talked about him going and becoming an educator and working his way into some of that stuff that he could start working with some football teams and things like that. Uh, because he loves the sport, he understands it. Uh, a lot better than I do, and and I used to think I understood it a lot, and uh, and so he's 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 good with that, and he's you know some of the things I've had dreamed for him was that he would be able to do some of the things he wanted to do. That's when we put him into flag football, so he could play football because he wanted to play football, you know, uh, basketball, you know, those kind of things. So same thing he's mentioned, you know, he wants to have a house, um, you know, he wants to have a relationship, you know. He wants to have a normal life, and I think it's possible. And that's the kind of things that I want to see for my son. Um, you know, I want to think back to the early days, okay, when all this devastation happened. Um, we had a good friend who, who guided us to a place called Center for Vision Impaired in Atlanta. And so, if you, whether you're in Atlanta, if that's a good organization, but if you're not, find an organization that works with your child's disability. By getting involved there, they were able to tell us and put us on the right track to, you know, here's what you need to look for and here's the type of people, you, need, you know, here's the things that you need to look for. Also going there, where we felt devastated, we were able to see parents who had kids who vision wasn't their worst issue. Um, there were kids with cancer there, that vision was just a sideline of it, and they were getting help, like we were for the vision thing. But there were, um, it put in perspective what we were dealing with, you know. Um, so I think that's good. Uh, another thing that provided for us was they, were, they brought people in to speak who were kids that were Riley's age now, you know, that talked about, um, you know, what they'd gone through and, and how their life was. And so to hear from the kid, like you've done today, um, is, is very important. I would say have hope because um, enjoy the small wins along the way and do not compare your child to other people's children. Pursue early intervention or any intervention. Trust your gut to to follow those. Um, like pursue, you know, educate yourself and all that kind of stuff and, and trust your gut to pursue some of those things. Have hope and, and get rest because it's exhausting. And like Greg said, um, it, it is a mountain climb. We're better for him when we take care of ourselves. There you go, look at those arms. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs>